Hey everyone, geophysicist Stefan Burns here. October started with a bang, with a long duration, strong geomagnetic storm that lasted nearly 72 hours, which greatly increased energetic flux across the planet, and that is still unfolding at this moment in time. When you get a long duration, strong storm like that, these sort of energy swings can last for not only days, but weeks after the event primarily also in the plasmosphere, the shell of plasma that is surrounding our planet out in outer space being confined by the magnetic field. And while we have a new solar storm impact coming in around October 7th through the 9th, in fact, three separate waves appear to be headed towards our planet, and that is going to continue this energetic flux. And while we also, before that, on the 6th and the 7th have a full moon, meaning that the moon will move into Earth's magnetic field and into the plasmosphere because of the sun-earth-moon alignment and that in general seems to subtly increase geomagnetic activity. It's like a plus one modifier. You have to consider how the moon has a very strong positive charge on the sunlit side, very strong negative charge on the dark side. This creates a very strong electric field gradient. This influences the flow and movement of plasma. It's also just a big, really massive object flying through the plasma sphere. So it influences all these different things that way. Our radiation belts are really highly charged right now. And so in general, everything is primed for there to be big, strong, energetic events. And well, we just saw that there was a magnitude six earthquake that struck off the coast of Japan. And 24 hours before that or so, there was a magnitude 6.1 earthquake that ruptured off the coast of Kamchatka Peninsula, Russia, the site of that magnitude 8.8 .8 mega quake and the location where there has been the most seismic activity on earth in 2025. So we had this G3 long duration geomagnetic storm that struck right at the very end of September, beginning of October. Then we had that magnitude 6.9 earthquake in the Philippines, magnitude 6 earthquake Indonesia near Bali. And now we had this magnitude 6.1 earthquake Kamchatka continuing on that seismic energy release from that location. We have multiple volcanoes that are erupting there as well. And they've been doing so since August. And now we have this magnitude 6 earthquake in Japan with another solar storm impact coming in or impacts and this full moon adding a plus one modifier to all of it. So that and much more in today's video. Let's jump right into our recent earthquake activity by looking at our USGS latest earthquakes map set for magnitude 4.5 and greater for the past week. And we see two main zones here, though the greatest seismic energy release is down here in the Philippines with that magnitude 6.9. But this is the most recent right here, this magnitude six that struck off the coast of Japan at a good depth, 46.8 kilometers. So no real risk of a tsunami there, but that is the location roughly of where that magnitude nine earthquake occurred, 9.1 in fact, back in 2011. So that was March 11th, 2011, the great Tohoku earthquake, and that area can have big earthquakes. And we haven't actually been seeing that many big earthquakes in Japan this year. So there's been a lot of, you could say, fears over that and worries over that, especially back in July when there was this uh, prophecy for there to be something to happen to Japan. There was a tsunami that hit Japan, so it was partly fulfilled, and that tsunami was generated from this magnitude 8.8 .8 mega quake up here. Here we see the swarming that is still occurring off the coast of Kamchatka, and if we list this right there, we see that the largest earthquake uh, for the past week is this 6.1 that occurred yesterday. And we've had also a bunch of magnitude five earthquakes. Look at the magnitude fives and all the magnitude fours here. So a tremendous amount of earthquake activity still at Kamchatka, which is crazy. And it's not really abating. We had that magnitude 7.8 just recently. Perhaps these are the final aftershocks, but if they keep continuing, then we, caught, we have to keep looking at that area with a close eye because perhaps it just keeps rumbling with activity. Back in 1952, it was a magnitude nine earthquake that ruptured. So we had that magnitude 8.8 .8 as pegged by the USGS. Some of the other agencies have it pegged as like a magnitude 8.6, 8.4, whatever. You have to have two magnitude 8.8s to equal a magnitude nine in terms of total seismic energy release. So if that is the amount of energy that is built up there that needs to be released, then we could be looking at a lot of earthquake activity from this region for a while. We could even be looking at another mega quake. And we nearly had one with that magnitude 7.8 recently. The magnitude 6.9, 
right down here is the biggest earthquake that we've had in the past week. We see that the aftershocks are continuing. And if we set this for only listing those on the map, we see that they're all uh, low magnitude fives and lower. And I would expect the aftershock to be around a magnitude six. Typically it's one magnitude less than the main shock. So uh, it's a little odd that we haven't had that aftershock yet, but that will probably come in the next week or so. Though if it's delayed, then that may be an indication that we have some more uh, seismic energy that needs to be released there even perhaps beyond a 6.9. This could be a foreshock, but the chance that's about two to 5% or so. So this is the latest earthquake that we've had, this magnitude six Japan. I'll keep you up to date on the earthquakes, but let us look at what's happening with the sun because we just had some interesting activity that launched some plasma our way and therefore we have some solar storm impacts inbound. Here we have our 171 and 304 angstrom views of the sun combined set for the past 36 hours or so. So going from the 3rd of October up to now the 4th, all in universal time. We'll see a sequence of events. First, you'll notice this eruption explosion occur right there. Boom shakalaka. And then we get this plasma filament to blast off there. Nice canyon of fire. And then we get a destabilization there. In general, quite a lot of activity actually across the entire sun but really we get this trifecta sequence right there that occurred in the past 36 hours. And so it seems that this has launched some plasma out into space based off of uh, the space weather forecasting and the modeling that they're doing. We have three different waves of plasma coming in. Let's check that out. Here we have a space weather model as provided by the UK Met Office and you'll see three subtle waves of energy that the sun launched according to this model. So take this with a grain of salt, but one, two, and three. Those are set to sweep by according to this model from October 7th to the 9th. We see that reflected here with the plasma density. So here we see our time, this all universal time. This is the seventh right there. We get this bump in the density, second bump, and then the third bump at this moment in time is set to be the biggest. So here it's top down, looking down on the ecliptic plane. This is the sun, this is the earth. And so we see that those are right in line with the earth and its orbit. And here we see the south north vertical view. So it looks like the majority of this plasma is going to the north, but we do get some of these waves to sweep by the earth, which is slightly inclined off of the ecliptic plane right there. So it looks like we have some plasma inbound as a result of this activity on the sun. And this is all coming in right after the full moon when we normally get greater geomagnetic disturbances and in general, just more energy flux on our planet, the heightening of energy and activity, the full moon effect. So let's check it out. Here we have our astrological astronomical chart set for today and this is true sky positioning. So it shows the position of the planets and a variety of other things in the night sky, what constellations they are in and those constellations are accurate to size. For example, you see that Virgo there is very large. We see Pisces is very large because they're large constellations. We also see that there's 13 constellations here because you do have a fucus cut through that ecliptic plane. So this is accurate for uh, where things are right now in time. So it's really an astronomical chart. And I'm also starting to use this more and more because it's the best way to track the position of, let's say like a Nova explosion or interstellar objects, comets, what have you. Whereas Western tropical astrology won't be accurate for that. So we see the moon right there at 11 degrees of Pisces at this moment in time. Here is the sun at 18 degrees of Virgo. And so we see that they are not yet in opposition, but soon will be. We can go forward a day and we see that the moon now is in Pisces. You'll notice that it's pretty close right here to Neptune and Saturn, and they're about to perform their great conjunction in February of 2026. So they're only three degrees apart in the night sky, very close together. Just a couple nights ago, I was looking through a telescope at a friend's house, like really awesome telescope, and we were zoned in on Saturn. You can see the rings and everything. And then we moved it to Neptune and it only shifted a little bit and there Neptune popped out, nice blue dot. So the moon is going to be pretty closely conjunct these uh, two planets and also the dwarf planet Ceres in the asteroid belt during this full moon. We see now it's pretty close to that opposition with the sun. We have to go forward just a few days now to get that, but we have this coming up uh, in just a few days now. So this again is about the 6th and 7th of October. It's really like the very end of October 6th and then the beginning of October 7th. 
And in general, when you have this opposition between the sun and the moon, you have just greater energy flux across the planet. Not only is there a stronger gravitational vector slicing through the earth and you get stronger tides, but you have the moon reflecting a lot more light from the sun into the Earth's systems. And there are other ones as well, for example, how the moon influences Earth's plasma sphere traveling through. And that's really a seven day transit that occurs every single month. Because you have this waxing gibbous phase where the moon first enters in the magneto tail because it has a little bit of width to it. And then you have the full moon and then you have the waning gibbous phase. And so we are already in that period where the moon just now moved into the magneto tail of the earth. And it can start to perhaps increase energetic flux across the planet as a result. It's gonna go and reach that exact opposition of the sun. We're gonna have that full moon and then these solar storm impacts come in. After we had that long duration G3 storm, let's see how that influenced the plasma sphere because that is what the moon is interacting with the most. And therefore, that is what may be the primary factor in determining the strength of these solar storm impacts. Here we have our electron flux as observed at 5.6 Earth radii in the plasma sphere. This is by the GOES satellites. These are geostationary satellites. And so we see the effect of that geomagnetic storm right there. Our radiation belts were depleted of electrons. The outer radiation belt is primarily composed of electrons. The inner radiation belt, which is closer in, is primarily composed of protons and positive ions. And so during a solar storm impact, you get both of those to dump their plasma closer into the Earth, into the ionosphere, and that charges up the ionosphere and drives these electric currents, which create those magnetic field swings, which then is the geomagnetic storm that we all know of. And you also actually see that plasma flowing and rippling around the globe during strong geomagnetic storms. Tons of people saw Aurora with that long duration G3 storm, especially up in Canada and Alaska. A lot of people shared their photos on the community page here on my channel. So you can check that out if you want. But now that that storm is passed, we see that the electron flux has risen dramatically. We are over the alert threshold. So this is something that we hit quite often, but reaching these values here, uh, it's not something that we have happening every single day. It is notable to get to these values where you have the plus three and it's like, let's say five or six or even seven. If you get a plus four, then you're really up there. And look at this one, that is three to the uh, 10 to the fourth. So the electron flux is very, very high. This is particles per cubic centimeter per second. And so these are order of magnitude jumps. So for example, going from here, we'll use the, the blue line, okay? Going from here, let's say it's 10 to the two and going up there, now it's just under 10 to the four, right? That's a 100X increase. So the radiation belts now are fully charged. They could probably charge up a little bit more, but unlikely to go that much beyond this, but we do see the uptrend. And when we get these new waves of plasma from the sun to hit the earth, we're gonna see this electron flux drop back down and drive that geomagnetic activity. And so we could have these impacts be stronger than expected. I don't really know what that's gonna resolve with the full moon there. I would say we probably have, we have at least a G1 impact coming in if these models are correct with what was launched from the sun. So if we do get something hit us, at least a G1 I would say, but I wouldn't be surprised if you go to G2 levels. I mean, maybe we even get a burst up to G3. I don't think we're gonna go beyond that, but we are in the Russell McFerrin effect right now, which means that in general, geomagnetic activity is heightened after equinox, specifically the September equinox during solar maximum really seems to be key. And you get better energy extraction from the solar wind during the month of October and also the month of April. But as we're focusing on now, the month of October. So it's possible that these impacts are stronger than expected. October has already been a wild month and Earth is already kind of perturbed after that long duration G3 storm. So anything is possible, but the big thing here is just to be aware of the fact that we have these solar storm impacts coming in and that we had the full moon there adding that plus one modifier. And so if you're someone that A, feels this and you're very bioelectrically sensitive, then you know take the steps necessary to uh, ground yourself and to eat well and do all the things so it doesn't affect you that much. And if you're a space weather enthusiast and you want to see Aurora, make sure you're prepared for the 7th, 8th, and 9th, though you will be competing with the light of the full moon. But perhaps you get some cool photography 
as a result of that. So that is what's coming up as it relates to space weather in the next few days. And to wrap up, here we have our past 10 days of geomagnetic activity with our KP index, a three hour measure of the swings in Earth's total magnetic field strength as observed at the surface by a global network of magnetometers. We see that we were in calm, quiet conditions here at the end of September. Look how that quickly changed, bumped up to this G3 level for three hours right there at this KP index of seven. That was on the 30th of September. And then a second bump there to 6.667, that'd be a G3 minus storm. And while we are going down now, we've been having some KP indices of a high three and four, but we are starting to go back down. But now we have this new solar storm impact or perhaps even multiple waves of plasma coming in for right after that full moon. So I'll keep you up to date on that as those come in, what happens. So please subscribe to the channel. Again, I've been your host, Stefan Burns. Thank you all so much for watching. Wishing each and every single one of you well. Also just an update on 3i Atlas. I've been scrubbing through the FTP servers and looking at everything. And well, there's no imagery that has been released yet after its close approach to Mars. So I'll keep you up to date on that as well and much more. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. I'll see you all in the next video.